All right, we're talking about faith and culture in the Near East, uh, the ancient Near East. Tomorrow, I'm going to be doing two talks, the history and culture of Oman. This is the day before we arrive in Salala, Oman. And then in the afternoon tomorrow, unity and diversity in the Middle East. So and we'll get to the rest of this stuff later. But as we start out, I, I want to say, as we discussed this morning, the Middle East, this area that we're sailing around and visiting, is where civilization really began. Now, we call it the Middle East. If you read anything historical or anything scholarly, they often refer, or it, that's having to do with the past here, they talk about the ancient Near East. Well, it's simply, the primary reason for that is the point of reference has changed. It used to be that the primary center of civilization from which they spoke was Greece. And from Greece, this is the Near East. When the reference point moved further into Europe and Americas later, then this became the Middle East because it was further away. In fact, the term Middle East was first used in the early 20th century by an American naval uh, advisor who was looking at situations, and he was the first one to call this the Middle East. But whenever you're reading anything scholarly or anything talking about the ancient times, they will refer to this as the ancient Near East, just so you know. Um, this area, as we talked about, has been the crossroads for I'll wait on that, has been the crossroads for so much because it is the land bridge between Europe, Asia, and Africa. And because of that, this has been the center for development not only of empires and of culture, but also of religion. The, the major religions of the world, this is a list of the, the major world religions by size, the, the I'm sorry, by founding. Um, the oldest of world religions is the Hindu faith which goes far, as far back as perhaps 4,000 years BC. The next is Judaism, and then it goes down Baha'i, the Chinese traditional religions, Shinto, which is the national religion of Japan, um, Jainism, then Christianity comes around 30 AD, Islam, after that, etc. There's a couple of other ways we can look at this. One of the things, though, I, I would point out to you is while we have Hinduism and Judaism are the two most ancient world religions, um, there was a period of time, which was only about a hundred years or so, in which a number of the major world religions all happened within about a hundred years. Buddhism, the Chinese traditional religions, which includes uh, the Confucianism, Taoism, as well as some of the other shamanistic religions in China, uh, Shinto and Jainism all happened between about 560 and 420 BC. That is such an important time in terms of the, the development of religious beliefs, it's actually, it has a, they have a name for it, it's called the Axial Age. And why that is, nobody really knows. You know, there was a big gap between Judaism, which you can say 2000, that's around the time of Abraham, or you might say 1400s, which was the time of Moses, when the religion actually is formulated, but you have a huge gap then, and you have several major religions happening at one time, and then Christianity coming along over 400 years, about 400 years after that, in about AD 30, then Islam 600 years later. So you get kind of a picture of that. In terms of size, the world religions, Christianity is the largest of the world religions, constituting about 29.5%, or 2.2 billion people. Islam is second at 1.6 billion, about 21%. Now, Islam is the fastest growing religion. Interestingly, it's primarily not because of conversions, but because the Islamic countries tend to have the highest birth rate. And so they are, uh, the, the increase in Islam is because the Islamic countries are some of the largest uh, countries in, in terms of population, and they are growing very quickly. Um, there is some estimate that by 2025, Islam may be as big as Christianity in terms of the number of adherents. We then have Hinduism at 1.1 billion, Buddhism, the Chinese traditional religions, etc. For the sake of our discussion, we are going to be talking about the religions that started in or started because of things that happened here in the Middle Eastern region. Christianity, the world's largest religion, began in Palestine, what we know of as Israel. The Islam began in Arabia, in Mecca and Medina, and then spread from there. We also have Sikhism, Judaism, and Baha'ism. Judaism you know, the other two you may not be as familiar with. All of these are monotheistic religions. Sikhism is sort of a melding, sort of a melding, this is probably offensive if there are any Sikhs in the audience, 
of Islam and Hinduism. It's a little bit of both. It primarily was from northern India, but because it is very similar to Islam and there was a lot of Islamic influence, it's related to the things that happened in this region. And then Baha'ism is a direct offshoot of Islam. It's considered a heretical offshoot by people in the Muslim faith. But all of these are sourced to a greater or lesser extent from the Middle East, and all of them are monotheistic religions. So that kind of gives you a basis in terms of world religions. Now let's look at this historically. The religious beliefs in the ancient Near East, we're going to first look at the Mesopotamian primitive polytheism. Mesopotamia, again, is where culture began. It is the air, land between the rivers, the Tigris and Euphrates. That is where we have the first evidences of uh, human worship and religion. I call it primitive polytheism for reasons that will be obvious as we look at it, in that the, the deities were quite confusing, and they didn't have faces. They tended to be just symbolic. Later on, we end up with the Egyptian, more sophisticated polytheism. They had multiple deities, but those deities were very well defined and recognizable. It's, it's very difficult to recognize the deities of ancient Mesopotamia. We then get even more sophisticated in terms of the polytheism of Greece and Rome. And we'll discuss that a little bit. Again, you say, well, Greece and Rome aren't in the Middle East. Well, because of our good friend Alexander the Great, the, Greece religion, the, the uh, Greek religions and later the Romans, they influenced this area widely, and so those are factors. And then lastly, we, well not lastly, the ancient mystery religions. What happened was the Greco-Roman religions, people got tired of them. There was very little being offered from those religions. And so they developed this, um, there was a period of time in which ancient Persian and ancient Egyptian religious beliefs sort of got woven into some, some Greek and Roman religion beliefs and they created what's called the mystery religions. We'll discuss that. And then finally, the rise of monotheism, which include particularly Judaism, Christianity, and Islam in that order. They are the three great uh, monotheistic religions, and we'll, we'll look at that. So let's back up, talk about the first of these, which is the Mesopotamian primitive polytheism. As we said this morning, this area is the, the almost certainly the earliest civilization, depending on how you define civilization, of irrigated crops, the building of cities, domesticated animals, irrigation, writing, that sort of thing. Now at the same time, one of the other things that marked this area was the development of very specific religious beliefs, another one of the markers for civilization developing. Some say, depending on how you define it, civilization starts as far back as 12,000 BC. The, the Venus of uh, uh, Willendorf that I showed you earlier, and I'll have another image of her in a second, goes back uh, perhaps 11,000 BC. And so people say, well, isn't that a mark of civilization? Again, it depends on how you define civilization. Most historians, uh, cultural anthropologists, would say that civilization as we might recognize it happened somewhere around 3200 to 3500 BC. So this place where cities were developed, um, a group of cities, they developed religious belief that had literally hundreds of thousands of deities. If you think that's a lot, it's estimated that Hinduism has 300 million deities. Oh. Look at that. So they had hundreds of, hundreds of thousands of deities, and um, almost everything was deified. And the reason for that was because they struggled in the ancient primitive polytheisms especially, they struggled to try to understand and explain the natural phenomena around them. They had no scientific explanations for anything. And so when extraordinary things happened in the natural world, a thunderstorm, a flood, um, the, an, an unexpected growth of plants, they were trying to find ways to either understand that or explain it or feel a little protected from the things that seemed dangerous. And so they developed religious beliefs around them. And many times they associated deities with those things. So the experience of the natural world was much of what gave the Mesopotamians and the people in ancient times their religious beliefs. They created ways to try to explain and feel a little in control of the natural phenomena. For instance, here in Mesopotamia, uh, the people would wreck they would see a storm occurring in the mountains, the Zagros or Taurus Mountains, and the next thing they know, there's a flood. 
And so they believed the gods of the mountains were unhappy for some reason and they were creating destruction because of it. As I said, the loudest sound anybody ever heard before amplification was thunder. Well, this extraordinary, you can imagine never having heard anything as loud as this and you get a massive thunderstorm to try to understand what's going on. At this time, the two primary, or the two most important uh, deities were the deities of fertility, which was necessary for the birth of children and for the growing of crops, both necessary for the tribes to survive. And this Venus of Illendorf, there are literally thousands and thousands of these kinds of images that have been found all over Europe, Middle East, and Asia. The idea of a fertility god, almost always with pendulous breasts, which suggests there were children around, always overweight. I, I sometimes wondered if that's what all everybody's girlfriend looked like back then. But there, that means there was plenty of food. And so that too was a sign of fertility. Some of the other earlier images, earliest images we have, and this is one from Chapel Hayek in Turkey. Um, she's actually giving birth as she's seated there. Uh, there's a baby emerging from her. Um, but these are ancient, ancient kinds of images related to fertility. The most, one of the most important, not the most powerful, but considered one of the most important of the ancient deities. We have various kinds of votive figures that are representative of worshipers. These have been found in ancient temple sites. And then we have various other kinds of reliefs. This is from Mesopotamia. It represents some of the different deities. And you'll notice they're not recognizable. They don't have features that you could, if you saw one, you'd go, oh, I know which deity that is. They're a very general kind of representation. This is the primitive nature. You'll notice that there was a god of the river, though, coming up out of the waters here. Um, so we get very primitive representation of all kinds of deities. Now, I want you all to memorize this chart. <laughs> this is a genealogy of some of the later Mesopotamian deities. And I, don't, I know you can't even see that from back there, but uh, I'm showing this to you in order to give you a sense of what, what a jumble the ancient primitive polytheism was. Now, you will notice the two gods at the very top of it Namu was the mother goddess who was the fertility god. And Anu was the sky god responsible for the heavens and thunder and those sorts of things. There you get the two primary deities in ancient times. Fertility and the sky god. The one that you depended upon to help uh, preserve you and the one that you felt you needed to, to uh, in some way satisfy so that he didn't destroy you. In this big list of things, there's several others. The ancient Mesopotamian um, creation myths, for instance, Tiamat, who was one of the early gods, it's a female, her husband, Abzu, is killed. Well, well the story is kind of funny. Tiamat and Abzu have children, and then their children have children, and the grandchildren of Tiamat and Abzu make so much noise, they can't sleep. Tiamat and Abzu can't sleep. So Tiamat decides she's going to kill her grandchildren. Well, the grandchildren find out about this plan, and they go to one of their children, whose name is, whoa, wrong button, Marduk. Marduk became the primary god of Babylon. And they go to Marduk and say, Marduk, you've got to protect us from your great-grandmother, our grandmother. And Marduk ends up tearing Tiamat apart. And when he tears Tiamat apart, part of her becomes the sky. At this point, there was no created world. They were just the gods. Part of her becomes the sky, part of her becomes the horizon, part of her becomes the earth. And that's the story. And in fact, Abzu, um, well, not Abzu, the uh, Kingu, who's the other consort, he is wounded in the process and his drops of blood mix with the dirt and from that are made human beings. And humans are made in order to do all the work so the guys don't have to. Seems sometimes still true today. But um, so you, that's how humans, so all of this is the creation myth. And this is also very interesting. If you spent some time on this chart, you would see just how confused this whole thing was. For instance, there is a god called Enki. Enki is the god of the earth, of wisdom, and of fresh water. And on, on this sort of uh, genealogy of the Mesopotamian gods, Enki is his own grandson, his own great-grandson, and his own great-great-grandson. It was very confused back right there. And so we look at this, and, and yet all of these various gods are assigned the god of fresh water. There were two gods of mud 
because what did they have a lot of in the river valleys there? They didn't have any stone. Everything they made was made out of mud. They had two different deities that were gods of mud. Um, gods of the fresh water, gods of the salt water, because they, they were close to salt water in the Persian Gulf, etc. Now that's the ancient primitive Mesopotamian uh, polytheism. When we get to Egypt, Egypt, one of the, uh, almost as old as the Mesopotamian culture, they uh, are different because, as I said today, they had the longest continuous history of any other culture. Well, when a culture exists for a long time, they have time to develop more refined understanding of things. You know, they would refine and refine and refine. And so, whereas some of the Sumerian uh, or the Akkadian, the Assyrian, Babylonian, their gods still tended to be pretty primitive. In Egypt, they had 3,000 years to develop a much clearer sense of who their deities were. And they ended up with deities that you could recognize, that had particular features, particular responsibilities. In this case, you can see they have uh, Osiris, the judge, the god Sobek, who's the god of protection, uh, um, various others, Anubis, who was responsible for the underworld and for uh, judgment, all of these very specific kinds of responsibilities. Now, they sometimes overlapped, and one god might have more than one area of responsibility, but it was a much clearer and cleaner, and therefore what I call a more sophisticated polytheism. Um, we're we're going to talk a lot more detail about that when we get into the Egypt talks. But you can see some of these gods, some you might recognize, Anubis, the jackal-headed god, Osiris and his wife Isis, uh, Hathor, you may have heard of, and you can even get action figures. <laughs> Emily Teeter was very excited when I told her that you could buy action figures of these guys, uh, the various of the uh, Egyptian gods. So we'll get into a little more detail on that. There's one event, though, I want to mention now that happened in the development of Egyptian religion, and that is... I'm in Hotep IV. We're in the New Kingdom now, and you'll understand what that means, 18th Dynasty. In the New Kingdom, there was first Amenhotep III, one of the pharaohs. Amenhotep decided that he really liked the god Aten, A-T-E-N. And um, you've heard of Ra, the sun god. In fact, uh, favorite bumper sticker that we, we saw it said, Isis, Isis, rah, rah, rah. <laughs> that doesn't mean that the, the, the terrorist group, okay, Isis the goddess. In fact, I had somebody ask me on the trip last time, why did these Muslim people start worshiping the goddess Isis? And I went, no, 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 Isis is an acronym for, you know, the Islamic State of Iraq and Syria. It has nothing to do with the goddess Isis in Egypt, Isis in Egypt. But Amenhotep III really liked Aten. Aten was the deity that was the manifestation of the sun god Ra. They broke it up. In other words, Ra was the sun, but the warmth that you felt and the light that you got and all the other benefits like plants growing from the sun, that was considered a different deity, Aten. Amenhotep III really liked Aten and kind of elevated it. Well, when his son came along, Amenhotep IV, he decided Aten was going to be the only god in Egypt. And in order to get away from Thebes, which we know as Luxor, we're going to visit there, he moved the capital north to Amarna and set up Amarna as the center for the worship of Aten, as the only god. It was an early effort at monotheism, or to give you a technical term, henotheism. What henotheism means there may be multiple gods, but we're only going to worship one of them. All right? So this is um, Amenhotep IV, also called Akhenaten. He changed his name. Akhenaten means effective for Aten. And you will see the sun here, the rays, and you'll see this in some of the carvings, even though this wasn't popular in uh, Luxor at the time. You'll see it from time to time. The rays will come down at the end of the sun rays. They look like hands sort of caressing the people. This is his wife who, if you've never heard of Akhenaten, you probably have heard of his wife. His wife's name was Nefertiti. The bust of Nefertiti, this beautiful, long neck, and I mean, just a gorgeous face, even though she looks, she's not young, she looks a little older. His wife was Nefertiti, and they're there playing with their children. Um, this is an image in the British Museum of Akhenaten. Well, he tried to turn Egypt into a monotheistic state. Sorry about that, I know I'm in your way. Um, and it worked while he was alive because he was Pharaoh and he had the authority to do that. But it, and it was called the Amarna Rebellion in history, 
when Akhenaten, or Amenhotep IV, died, they reverted back because the power of the priests of all the other uh, gods, particularly Amun, Amun-Ra, those two were kind of joined, they took over again and reverted back. And they, they made a great effort to try to destroy images of Akhenaten because they considered him a heretic, because he wanted to worship only one god. We're going to jump again, as I did this morning, a little bit to the um, west now. The polytheism of Greece. We have to start with both um, the Minoan culture and especially the Mycenaean culture to talk about the Greek polytheism. In the city-states of Greece, each of the city-states developed their favorite god. How many of you all have been to um, Ephesus? All right. Do you know who the god was of Ephesus? Okay. Artemis. Artemis was the god of Ephesus. In fact, the temple to Artemis in Ephesus was one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. I'm going to show you a picture of that in a minute. Um, in Athens, who was, the, who was the goddess of Athens, the patron goddess? Yeah. Athena. That's what the Parthenon was all about, was a temple to Athena. So each of these city-states had their own favorite god. And they perceived their gods, even though they were more sophisticated, they still saw them as related to the natural phenomena around them. It is what the people were perceiving and interpreting as deities. Um, and they usually related something to the location. For instance, Mycenae, that we talked about this morning, the favorite god of Mycenae was the god Poseidon. You, remember, you know who the god Poseidon was? What was he in charge of? The sea. The sea. Why do you think Mycenae might have been interested in the god of the sea? Right? They were surrounded by water. And they were, you know, they, they traveled, they, they did shipping, they conquered islands, that sort of thing. So you got a lot of that. Um, some of those Mycenaean gods were then adopted into Greek beliefs. And a thousand years after Mycenae, after the apex or the height of Mycenae, the Greek, the golden age of Greece under Pericles and whatnot, they refined their beliefs into the 12 great gods of Olympus. Most of those you've heard of, they were the gods Zeus, Poseidon, Apollo, Artemis, Aphrodite, the goddess of love, Ares, the god of war, Hera, Demeter, Athena, Hermes, Hephaestus, and Dionysus, the goddess of, god of wine. Now all of these had very human characteristics. No longer this idea like the Mesopotamians where you don't recognize them, nor the Greeks sort of, uh, while they respected the Egyptians, they kind of laughed at them because one historian in Greece talked about the Egyptians and their dog-headed gods. Mm -hmm. Well, this is what the Greek gods look like. These are the Greek gods lounging around on a Saturday afternoon on Olympus. And all of them were very human. They looked like humans. Now, unfortunately, humans could not approach the gods. They could not relate to the gods, although the gods could choose to relate to humans, including the male gods having sex with human women. Uh, Hercules, or Heracles, as the Greeks call him, was the son of god Zeus, the top god, top-notch god, the one at the top, and a woman named Alamene. And so there were children that were believed to have been the, the, the result of gods and women having relations. But it was a very human kind of thing. But still, you could not initiate a relationship with these gods. When you travel in the Greek world, this, of course, is a nighttime image of, uh, that I took. Last time we were here, there's a full moon. I sort of edited that out. But this is the Acropolis and the Parthenon, especially focused toward Athena, the patron god of the city of Athens. This is the Parthenon up close. This is a model of the temple to um, Artemis in Ephesus. In fact, people who were writing during the ancient times, some of them had visited some of the other wonders of the ancient world, and they said none of them compared to this. It was an enormous building. And so this was the kind of temple. In fact, I think most people, when they think of ancient Greece, they either picture a naked guy with a discus, or they picture this, these temples, because they became so common and they were sort of an image of what the Greek world was like. Well, why are we talking about Greek gods and we're talking about the Middle East? Because of Alexander the Great. We'll have a whole talk about him. But Alexander started in Macedonia. Technically, he was not Greek. A lot of people don't get that. In fact, when um, two years ago when I spoke on this and I said Alexander wasn't Greek, one of the guys, one of the men on the boat, when we stopped somewhere, he told this Greek man that Alexander the Great wasn't Greek, and I think the guy was ready to hunt me down and shoot me. 
because he wasn't Greek, he was Macedonian, but Macedonia has been developed a, a love for the Greek culture and the Greek myth and all of that, and Alexander was re had really bought into that. One of the first things that they did, however, his father Philip conquered all of Greece, and then when Philip died, Alexander crossed over, defeated the uh, Persian Empire throughout Asia Minor, went down into Egypt. Now, you'll notice, see that little sticky out thing out in the desert there? When Alexander got to Egypt, he was very aware, his mother, Olympia, had told him that he was the son of Zeus, that Zeus had come to her, and that when she bore Alexander, he was the son of Zeus, like Hercules was. Well, Alexander always sort of believed that. And then when he started this great conquest, and he's defeating armies many times his size and doesn't seem to be able to lose, he was thinking, the further he went, the more he believed this. He gets to Egypt, and they welcome him and as being sort of a, a new pharaonic kind of figure, a pharaoh figure. He goes out into the desert, this pointy part here, there is a, uh, out in the desert at an oasis, there is a, uh, a site where they worshipped Zeus Ammon. It was a combination of the Greek god Zeus and the Egyptian god Ammon, and there was a temple out there. He went out and the oracle at Siwa, which is that location in the desert, declared to Alexander, you are the, the son of Zeus Ammon. You are divine Alexander. And he went, cool. <laughs> Knew it all the time. And so he, his troops got really tired of him reminding him, wait, 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 I'm not just a person. You know, I am actually the son of Zeus Ammon. And he traveled there. He got enough courage out of that, apparently, that he traveled all the way over to India and then returned and ended up dying in Babylon as on the way back right there. But this idea of one of the things is when you talk about Zeus Ammon being the deity that he was supposed to be the son of, the Egyptians, because they were influenced by the Greeks, they sort of clumped their gods together. This idea of uh, what's called syncretism, where most ancient religions, they were happy to accept other gods if somebody else came along. In the Roman Empire, the Romans were especially anxious to accept the deities in other pla places that they conquered. In fact, this, does that look familiar? These are not the Greek gods I showed you a minute ago. These are the Roman gods. And yet, they look very much the same. Okay, it's like they're next door. But the Roman pantheon, pantheon looked very much like the Greek pantheon through syncretism, the adopting of other things. When the Romans conquered the areas that had been influenced by Greek religion, they took all of the Greek gods and lined them up and identified them as being different names for the gods they already believed in. The god Zeus, in, uh, which was the Greek god, the, you know, the, the number one god, was seen as related to the Roman god Jupiter as the father of gods or sky god. Hera was the same as Juno, the wife of Zeus or Jupiter, Aphrodite as Venus, Ares as Mars, Athena as Minerva, etc. And they just said, great, we love having gods. We'll take as many as you can bring. <laughs> this is actually why the Romans, the Romans made special concessions for the Jewish people. Because Julius Caesar, the first of the great rulers, and, and um, he really liked the Jews. He thought they were smart, they were industrious, and he said, you guys can do whatever you want. Later on, Alexander, the same thing. I'll tell you that story when we get to Alexander. But when the Christians came along, just like the Jews, the Christians refused to recognize these other gods. And they refused to burn offerings to any of these gods or to the emperors who declared themselves to be divine. Well, that's one of the things that led to almost 300 years of persecution of the Christians by the Roman Empire is because the Romans could not understand why these people would not accept other gods than the one they claimed to be real. Now, much like the Greek um, identification of the religious beliefs. These are examples of Roman temples. Look familiar? Again, there's, it's very hard to tell the difference. So, it, it was more common for Roman temples to have a box inside, because I guess they were some of the places, that is, the pillars, but then there would be an enclosed space inside. Not always. I think it's because many of the Romans lived in colder places than the Greeks did, so they wanted some sort of uh, containing inside their temples. This um, that there, and this gives you one indication, one of the reasons that the Romans succeeded in many ways when the Greeks couldn't, 
especially with building, roads and bridges and aqueducts and all that, was because of the arch. The, arch. the Greeks never developed the arch. And the Romans did. And so you see that reflected in their uh, various kinds of building. Now, one of the problems that they had in the Greco-Roman world, and by the first century this had become especially apparent, is that people were not feeling any satisfaction from worshiping either the Greek or the Roman gods. There was no personal interaction that they could initiate. There was no sense of salvation or immortality. No idea that my relationship with a god is going to benefit me after I die. There was no real joy except for Dionysus Bacchus, you know, the wine gods. Uh, there was some joy there. But apart from that, there was no real sense of satisfaction or joy. Um, they, they didn't encourage any sort of human connection, and there was not even any motivation to act ethically. There was no reason to try to be good because of anything having to do with the Greek or Roman religions. That led to the development of the mystery religions. The mystery religions uh, particularly were because people were burned out on the Greco-Roman gods. They weren't getting anything out of it, and they were tired of it. They were looking for something that would give them a sense of greater satisfaction. And along come these mystery religions, most of them based upon beliefs that started in either Persia or in Egypt. The mystery religions were secretive. You had to be an initiate, so there's some sort of feeling special because you were one of the few that could be part of this. They were heavily ritualistic, and they promoted a mystical awakening. You will benefit from this rather than just do something to keep the gods from being upset with you. They were, as I said, exotic. They offered a sense of immortality, of being able to relate to the God not only in this life, but they talked about an afterlife. They encouraged relationship not only with the deities, but with each other. In fact, when you went to, say, you were a part of a, the Mithraic mystery religion cult, and you went to a ceremony, whether you were a Roman senator or a slave, everybody took off their clothes, they all put on the same robes, and they stood shoulder to shoulder. So all of a sudden, somebody who's one of the lower caste of people in the whole society could feel just as important as anybody else. All of these were important reasons why people really got excited about the mystery religions. And we don't actually know a lot about the mystery religions, beyond what I've just told you, because they were a mystery. <laughs> they, because they were secretive and they had only initiates were privileged to know what went on there, they didn't write this stuff down. You know, we have a few personal recollections, but not a lot of details. Things like the cult of Sibylle and her consort Addis, Mithra, uh, the Mithraic mystery religions. Let me show you some pictures. Mithra, up here, killing the bull, um, he was a Persian war god. And the Roman soldiers loved this because he was a military figure. The terabolium, the sacrifice of the bull, was one of the big symbols. And they had this kind of gross uh, version of baptism where in a cave they would have a cave with a upper chamber with a grate in it and the new initiates would come in below that and they would bring a bull in and slit its throat over that grate and the blood would pour down over all of the initiates and that was their baptism into the uh, Mithraic cult. We have the cult of Isis here in the center. Isis who was the Egyptian goddess who was the wife of, um, of Osiris. And this is her uh, taking care of her child, Horus. Now, Isis was considered the friend of slaves, of sinners, of artists, of the downtrodden, and of children. Who wouldn't love that? Whereas none of the Greco-Roman gods offered those kinds of relationships. You have Serapis here. Serapis came out of the Ptolemaic Empire when the Greeks, uh, Macedonians actually, took over Egypt. It was an effort to try to make both the Greek gods and the Egyptian gods kind of get together. And he was considered the consort of Sibylle. Sibylle is the modern version, the updated version of the fertility goddess. This is what she looked like in uh, the mystery religion. The same goddess, that's what she looked like thousands of years before that in, in Chateau Hayek. This is the same fertility goddess. They cleaned it up a lot. Um, you also have uh, Addis here who is the sun god and consort to, um, well, all of these various gods, everybody got into it because each of them represented a kind of relationship you could have. If you were a mother, a slave, uh, if you were uh, a soldier, people could relate to this stuff. And so the mystery religions, while we don't know a lot about them, were an important kind of bridge 
from the ancient polytheism. We now get to what we're familiar with, and that is the rise of monotheism, or ethical monotheism, as it's called, technically. You will remember I said that one of the problems with the Greco-Roman gods is there was no, there was nothing about them that told you you needed to be a good person, or that there was any advantage to do right, as opposed to doing wrong. The monotheistic religions came along, and there are two things about them that are very different. One, they say that God, the one God, not multiple gods, wants you to do the right thing. That morality is important, and you should be good and right and true, not just whatever you want. The other aspect of it is, whereas the primitive religions, or the, prim the polytheistic religions, they were based primarily on what people perceived in nature, in an effort to try to explain or in some ways get control of the forces of nature that they perceived around them. Monotheism, starting with Judaism and then Christianity and Islam, and then the offshoots of Sikhism and Baha'ism and others, they believe that rather than people perceiving the natural world and developing religious beliefs out of that, that God himself, the one God, had revealed himself, that he had taken the initiative to communicate his desires and his will to the people. So rather than it being a perceived religion, the monotheistic religions are received religions, where the message is given rather than just you look out and see what you can figure out. The oldest of these, of course, is Jewish monotheism. Around 2000, whenever you see a C like that, you probably know this, that means circa. That means that's the best we know. That's as close as we can get, about. So about 2091 or sometime about two, two millennia uh, BC, God speaks according to the Jewish tradition to Abram, who later is renamed to be Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means father of many, because one of the promises God gave Abraham is you will be the father of many people. He says, follow me, go where I send you. I will be your God, you will be my people. I will give you a great people. I will give you a land where your people can live. That's the promised land. And I will, uh, through you, I will bless all the peoples of the earth. That's where, around 2000, is where we believe Judaism can be marked as beginning. Um, uh, Abraham lived in Ur, down in Mesopotamia, down in the rivers. He moved up to Haran with his father, Terah. His father died, and all the rest of his family. And then he moved down into first Egypt and then into Canaan, ancient Israel. The second great event... And I'm going to get into more detail about these when I talk about the children of Abraham. The second great event was God called Moses. About 500 years or so later, God called Moses out of being a shepherd in uh, Midian to go to uh, Egypt to take his people out of slavery there and bring them out. And in the process of coming back out, God gave the law to Moses. We are going to go to St. Catherine's Monastery at the foot of Mount Sinai, which traditionally is the place both where, where Moses got the call of God at the burning bush, which is there. You'll be able to see what's understood to be the plant that's still there, that they say was the burning bush. And you also will see Mount Sinai where the law was given. Now, whereas the people of the, the Hebrew people began with Abraham, the religion of Judaism actually begins with the giving of the law through Moses. So you can say that the Jewish faith begins with the call to Abraham in 2091 or in the mid-1400s B.C. with uh, Moses. When they, God gave the Torah, as it's called, the law, or instruction is a better word, that was the basis of what later became the Hebrew Bible, which is commonly today called the Tanakh. Tanakh is a push-together word. It's not quite an acronym because it takes parts of three words. The three sections of the Hebrew Bible are the Torah, the first five books of Moses, which is the law or instruction, then the writing of the prophets, which in Hebrew is Nevaim, and then the writings, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, the wisdom writings, which is called Ketuvim, or writings. You take those three words, the Torah, the Nevaim, and Ketuvim, and you push them together, and you create the word Tanakh, which is the standard Hebrew word referring to the Hebrew Bible. Um, We'll get into that a little bit more later on. And then the third great event in the formation of Judaism is around the year 1000. I often say, if you want to know the history of the Jewish people, around 2000 was Abraham, around 14, 1500 was Moses, and around 1000 was King David and his son King Solomon. 
Those three figures are the primary figures in the history of the Jewish people and of the Jewish faith. Because around uh, 1000 BC or so, God has the prophet Samuel call up David to become the king of Israel. Now, he wasn't the first king. The first king was, was uh, Saul. Saul messed up, and God replaced him with David. David was the one that made them a great nation, and then Solomon after him. After David and Solomon, there was a united kingdom. This is uh, what we know of as Israel today. Uh, the united kingdom, which was growing under these two, later on, because Solomon offended God, they were split up into two kingdoms. Those two kingdoms were the northern kingdom of Israel, which I told you today the Assyrians carried off into captivity, and the southern kingdom of Judah, with Jerusalem as, it, as its capital. Samaria was the capital of the northern kingdom of Israel. Jerusalem is its capital, and this is the only part of this whole um, eastern Mediterranean basin that the Assyrians did not conquer. They did not conquer Jerusalem and Judah. And so after King Solomon dies, the kingdom is divided. In 722, Assyria destroys the northern kingdom of Israel. In 586, the Babylonians destroy the southern kingdom of Judah and carry um, the, the Jewish people off into captivity. Now this was a horrific time for the Jewish people, and in fact is one of the things that formed Judaism as it exists today. I had a Jewish rabbi on my last, uh, the last trip we took, and it was great to get some reactions from him after that. But the, when the northern kingdom was destroyed by Assyria, the Jews in the south said, well, pff, you deserved it, because they had been horrible. They'd never had a good king in the north. They had done terrible things. In the south, however, when the Babylonians, and they had had some good kings, a lot of bad kings too, in the southern kingdom of Judah, when the Babylonians defeated them, destroyed the temple, destroyed the city of Jerusalem, and took them off into captivity, that was extraordinarily traumatic to the Jews that still exist, because they asked themselves, is Yahweh God, who we believe is the one true God, is he not as powerful as the Babylonian gods? Does God no longer love us? Are we no longer his chosen people like we believed that we were? How do we continue to be Jews? How do we continue to worship Yahweh when the things that marked us being the people of God, like the promised land and the temple, when we don't have those anymore. How do we do this? And they remembered that the northern, the tribes in the northern kingdom of Israel had gotten assimilated. They no longer were distinct in their personality as Jewish people. And they were saying, how do we keep that from happening to us? This was the beginning, the time of the Babylonian exile, which started in 586 and lasted for only about 45 years or so. The growth of rabbinic Judaism, which is the Judaism that we still know today. Rabbinic Judaism said we don't have temple, we don't have priests anymore, we don't do animal sacrifice because that was only to be done by priests at the temple, so what do we do now? This was when synagogues really began to be important. They had some houses of prayer before, but the synagogue became the focus of Judaism at this time. The synagogue was the place for prayer, it was a place for study, and that's why, from this time on, was why study has always been so critically important to the Jewish people. You all saw Yentl, right? You know, this idea that we argue about what the text says and what does it mean. And it also became the place of community so that they would not be assimilated. This was the start of rabbinic Judaism. They didn't have priests anymore. They now had rabbis or teachers. And the synagogues became the focus for prayer, for study. That's where the shuls or schools were and it was a place of community. And that's still true today, because the temple is, no, is still not there. There are some uh, groups of the Jewish people who believe that in some, at some point in the future that the temple will be rebuilt. And they're, they're expecting that the sacrificial system will come back into, into focus. Now, not a large number of Jewish people, but some do. After this, in 538, <laughs> That's when Babylon was defeated by the Persians, and Cyrus the Great tells the Jewish people they can go back home. And they go back, and they rebuild the temple, and they rebuild the walls of the city of Jerusalem and re-inhabit that area. Then in 332, that's when Alexander sweeps through and takes over everything. He conquers the whole Persian Empire. Um, he spreads the Greek language and culture, and Judaism gets split up into the Hebraic Jews, who were the Pharisees. Hebraic means they wanted to stay as Hebrew Jews, and the Hellenized Jews, or the Sadducees. Then, in 63 BC, Pompey comes through and conquers the whole region for Rome. 
And in 39 BC, the Roman Senate makes uh, Herod the Great the king over this whole area. I'm going to skip over this part. There was a huge um, Greek influence on the Jewish people, so much so that by the second century BC, many of the Jews no longer could read Hebrew. They couldn't read their own scripture. And so that was the reason why they called scholars down to Alexandria in Egypt to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. That is today known as the Septuagint because there were traditionally understood to be 70 scholars that translated the Hebrew scripture into Greek so that Jews who could only speak Greek could now read it. That's very important because the, the documents that they used to translate the Hebrew Bible into Greek, we no longer have access to some of those more ancient documents. And so the Septuagint, the Greek version, is considered a major source for us to understand what the Hebrew Bible actually says. We then come down to um, the fact that in the first century AD, the Jewish people had, for thousands of years by then, had a historic expectation that God would send a Messiah that after David, they believed that this would be a person from the line of David, that he would be a king like David. In Palestine, in Jewish's time, uh, the, in Jesus' time, this was very much the center of the world. Everybody passed through there, the crossroads of three continents. Politically and culturally, it was the perfect time for a new religion to come along because people were tired of the old religions. It was the time of the Pax Romana, which is the peace of Rome. You could travel anywhere in the Roman Empire and be relatively safe because the Romans made sure there weren't pirates or bandits. You also had the fact there were Roman roads you could travel on. You didn't have to have a passport to get anywhere. And there were good roads. You, everyone spoke Greek because of Alexander, and so there was a common language. Economically, it was a perfect time for a new religion, a new message of hope because of all of the Romans were oppressing, they were taxing everybody. And then morally and religiously, as I said, the world was tired of the old gods. They were looking for something that would give them hope. In fact, there was a large population of Gentiles, non-Jews, who were very interested in the Jewish faith because they had come to believe themselves that there must be just one God. These dozens and dozens or hundreds of, of gods doesn't make sense. There must be one God. So these Gentiles would go and listen to the Hebrew services, the Jewish services, outside the synagogues, but they wouldn't actually become a Jew. Why is that? Because for a man, that involved a very serious surgical procedure. <laughs> and the men weren't keen on doing that, especially because the Greek culture so glorified the human body. Well, when Christianity came along, you could believe in one God without having surgery. <laughs> and they were very open to that. Okay. So Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One, and by the way, we, we say Jesus Christ. Christ is not his last name. Christ is a title. The word Christ is Greek. The word Messiah is Hebrew. They both mean the same thing. They mean the Anointed One, the one who was anointed to be king. The scripture for, the, uh, for Christians is both the Old Testament or Hebrew Bible, the Tanakh, and the New Testament. The spread of Christianity was primarily because of this guy, I don't think that's... You'll notice that uh, Paul is always represented as being bald. You know, he's a smooth man, as we say. Um, and so you can recognize him amongst all of the icons and stuff because he's usually bald or has just a little patch. Paul was the one that God called, according to the Christian faith, to spread the news throughout all of Asia Minor, all the way over into Greece, and then eventually he was taken to Rome. So that by A.D. 70, this is within 40 years or so of Jesus' death, we have Christianity had spread all over Asia Minor, including north on the Black Sea, throughout Greece, all through Israel, sections in North Africa, and all the way as far as Rome. This was within 40 years of the death of Jesus. By 586, or I'm sorry, 565, this was what it looked like. Christianity had spread throughout Europe, all of these areas that are yellow or green. It has spread beyond the Roman Empire. The green line here is the Roman Empire, but all these other sections were also Christian. That was in 565. In 570, a man is born named Muhammad. When he's 40 years old, he, he's from Mecca in Arabia. He begins to get uh, visions that God is telling him that he is the one who is going to straighten out all the problems. There was a lot of paganism, multiple idol worship in Arabia at that time. He was to clean that up. And 
Muslims still believe that Christians and Jews were given God's revelation. That all the other uh, the monotheistic believers, Christians and Jews, are called people of the book in the Quran. But they believe that the Jewish scripture and the Christian scripture got corrupted. That people influenced it negatively. And Muhammad is responsible to clean all that up, he thought. So, within, as I showed you this chart earlier, during Muhammad's life, he was responsible for Islam spreading throughout most of the Arabian Peninsula. His immediate followers, the four caliphs after him, we'll talk a lot about this later, spread all this orange areas, and the next, uh, the Umayyad caliphs, spread up into to Western Europe, all the way over toward India, which is why Iran, Iraq, Pakistan, all of those are primarily Islamic countries today. So that was the spread. In fact, at its height, Islam had taken over all of this area, all the way up through Spain and Portugal, and threatened up into uh, France. This is the, the widest expanse they had. Later on, they got pushed out of Western Europe, but they took over all of the Turkey, or Asia Minor, and all the way up to the gates of Vienna. For several hundred, for a hundred years, they were outside the gates of Vienna. So this was the spread of Islam. Um, that, when you look at these maps and you realize how much they were encroaching on Christian Europe, you begin to get some idea why maybe the Crusades happened, and we'll talk about that. Today, Islam and the other religions, this is a map. The dark green is Protestant here. The lighter green is Catholic, predominantly. The uh, darker blue up here is Sunni Muslim. The lighter blue sections are predominantly, it's not exact, but are primarily Shia Muslim. And then you get areas like this, which are a combination of primitive religions and others. So this gives you an Hinduism over in here and Buddhism, all right? This is how the world religions kind of spread right now. I've gone over again, my apologies. Any questions about any of that? A lot of these things, when we talk about children of Abraham, we'll get into more detail about some of that, as well as the, the uh, introduction of Islam. But any questions about any of the things I've said? Right. Why is the development of religion considered a hallmark of civilization? Um, there has, why is, her question was, why is religion considered a hallmark of civilization? There has never been any culture found that did not have religious beliefs, ever. They are, they have believed in either multiple gods or a god. They have believed in angels or the supernatural or the spiritual or miracles. Anthropologists have never found a culture that did not have some sort of religious belief. Uh, it's also true that almost every religion has always had some sense that there's something wrong with us, you know, and what is broken about us. And various religions have tried to answer that question in different ways. But the fact that every culture that we've ever identified had religious beliefs is why I think we see religion or of some form as being a hallmark of a civilized culture. It's only been in a very recent time that we have a, a notable percentage of people who will, who will indicate that they are non-religious or without religious belief. That's a very modern phenomenon, like in our lifetimes kind of phenomenon. Um, other questions? Anything? Yes? Shia, Sunni, what's the difference? Shia and Sunni. That's a, there's a, there's no short answer to that. It has to do with the history going all the way back to the fourth, the fourth caliph or successor to Muhammad Ali and who, basically after Muhammad died, who's going to take over? And there were two different parties. Some of them thought whoever the best can, who, the one who could do it best should do it. Some thought Ali, who was the only male blood relative of Muhammad should be, and it's gotten even worse since then. There are theological differences. There are differences in terms of, uh, they all accept the Quran, but there are other documents in Islam, the Hadith uh, particularly, and they have different ideas of what they should follow. I will get into very specific uh, ways of answering that question when we do with the introduction to Islam, because it's, it is complicated, but it's very important. Any other questions? Now, I, I, I will tell you, oh, I'm sorry, yes? Okay, um, the crescent and the star are the two primary symbols of Islam. Let me address that when we get into Islam. I don't want to put you off on that, but I could, I could get into too much stuff and I've already gone long. But let me tell you, this morning, the Birthplace of Empires talk and this talk are the two most dense of any of the ones I will do. Uh, Islam is a little bit complicated. 
But um, so if you've borne through these, then I encourage you to continue to you know to come because uh, some of the things like tomorrow, the history and culture of Oman will be much simpler, much straightforward, but it's fascinating. And then unity and diversity tomorrow afternoon. Again, these are the ones I'm packing more stuff in and, and going especially long because. I think, and I've sort of gotten this response, my belief has always been that if I can do these in one, you know, one shot, you get a better overall perspective of them. You get a sense of the relationship of things, more so than if I broke it up into two or three talks, okay? I am available around the ship or right after this if you want for any other questions. Thank you very much, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Yeah.